Uh, yes, I can hear you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I hope all of y'all can hear me. Uh, I'm Kuma. I think uh, uh, yesterday y'all had a class with Anju. So today I'm going to do the strategic case study with y'all. And uh, you can keep your mics mute at I mean, mics mute. But anytime when you want to uh, raise a question, when you want any clarification, you're always free to unmute the mic and ask a question. Or you can even put it on the chat box. Uh, you're free. Uh, this is a, a you know interactive class. So don't worry. At any time, if you all want to disturb me, I'm surely available. You can do it. OK. So we are going to start the class. I'm recording this uh, lesson and you may be able to hear it later on uh, if you want it. Right. I think yesterday Anju did a lot of questions and a lot of things of focus. So I'm not going to look at uh, many of the areas what she would have done. But, uh, you know, uh, just to keep myself introduced, I'm from Sri Lanka. I'm Kuma. And for the last seven, eight years, I've been doing this online tuition. And uh, uh, basically, earlier the Topsima case study. But now, for the last six exams, this will be the seventh. It is a strategic case study, managerial case study, and operating case, operational case study. So uh, I just want to share a few of my thoughts about how to approach this case study. Uh, just to give you a few thoughts, probably which may be helpful for you, a uh, few things. Number one, always remember that you are working for this company. So remember you are part of AEN. You are a senior manager advising to the board of directors on strategic matters. So you must, uh, you know, uh, uplift your mental image to be that kind of a person all the time. Never think you are a student. Never think it's an exam. The six weeks the pre-scene is available before the exam. So we have about just about one month more before the exam. My few suggestions, I have been, I think I have done about now more than 100 students all over. Uh, my few suggestions is now it's good time Every day, just like you read your Quran or read your Bible or whatever it may be, start reading the pre scene every day. 10 15 minutes, just spend it. Try to understand the company. Try to know who this Luke is. Try to know who this uh, Fiona is. That kind of a thing is going to help you. Because what I want to tell you, even though you are sitting for an exam and this is the final exam that you are going to see, this is going to make a big difference in your life just after this exam. And once you get the results, when you have got through the uh, exam, you are almost a ACMA. You are a member of the SIMA Institute, which is a fantastic feeling uh, that for you, any one of us to have it. So all of you all must put that extra effort next 30 days, next 28 days. Put up that all your effort, sacrifice whatever, anything, everything to do this exam well. Having said it's an exam, I want to shift my focus a little bit. I want you to understand this case study. Don't take it as an exam. Think that you're working in this company, just like any of you are working in any of the places. You know, every day in an organization, we come across many problems, particularly at strategic level. It may be a competitor trade. It may be a product uh, not doing very well. It may be some media adverse report about your company. It may be a key employee wanting to leave the company. It may be something like something like uh, uh, what? Uh, something like uh, some person want to get out of the company. Uh, it may be something some person wanted to take over your company. So you find on a daily basis certain problems cropping up to your company, certain issues flaring up. It can be a good issue. It can be a bad issue. 
it may be you know uh, some product that you launched is doing much more better than what you planned and you probably want to increase the output whatever so there will be all sorts of things happening and what we need is simply uh, a kind of a scenario where we try to help our board of directors particularly because you are a very senior person with your knowledge with your communication skills and with your leadership skills and business skills and as you know this paper is marked on four different skills well, you all must be knowing this thing but i'm just going to share a few things this marked on four different skills technical business leadership people skills so these are the four skills this paper is marked out of 150 marks 150 marks and in each of these skills we should we are being weighted on a 25% so out of 150 37.5 technical Seven point five, and out of this thirty-seven point five, for you to get to the exam in each of these areas, you must get sixty percent. So on the technical skills, you must get two and a half. Business twenty-five and a half. Leadership twenty-two and a half. People skills twenty-two and a half. Total ninety. But just getting 90 total will not help you. Say, for example, in technical, if you get 17, even if you get, say, 25, 25, 25, in other areas, you may get 92, but still you will fail the exam. Because you are not got enough marks on the technical. So, unfortunately, it's marked through, a, marked through the... the the, the, there's a particular software which through which they go to this business leadership and people and uh, none of us have a, a kind of a, a predetermined idea the the unseen what we are going to get and also the, the way that they will look at but what we know is whenever they call about technical skills whenever you are writing a particular a solution you must support it with particular models. So, for example, you know, in your E3, you have learned some of the models, right? In P3, you have learned some of the models. So, what I suggest is, you know, you can't memorize all the models, but there are certain common things we can always use it. We must, whenever we are writing, we must refer to those things. For example, this one. You must say, as per SWOT analysis, we are over dependent on one particular source of revenue, only wind power. Something like that. We can do a pistol. So what I'm suggesting is before even now you can start doing things, already the SWOT is given in the in the precinct, you can go on doing. Right? So SWOT, the pistol. Then you know the Porter's five forces analysis. Then a uh, very important one will be the ends of matrix. New products, new markets, new products, existing market, old products, old markets, all that kind of a thing. You can use that one. And so then uh, the Porter's five forces, as I said, you can use a very, very important whenever we have evaluation, you can use um, the, the model, what we call Johnston's, Schools, Washington, the suitability, acceptability, feasibility. So in your Dropbox, I have put up a little bit of a note on this area. So, <laughs> sorry, suitability, acceptability, feasibility model. I would like if you all want to go to go to that one. 
try to get few things out of these models and uh, few models keep it up because you can't remember everything but when you come for the p3 maybe things like interest rate parity theory for if for uh, the purchasing power parity theory then maybe the fisher formula if that's relevant see then also maybe the on the f3 area the net present values internal rate of returns payback corporate governance in p3 so like that always you must speak with lot of technical backing because you have to remember you are an expert you are someone and and one of the most useful models that we have on the technical is the sima code of ethics so remember the sima code of ethics integrity professional behavior professional competency objectivity confidentiality just keep on mentioning these things you are going to get those marks i saw you some uh, in the previous groups i saw some brilliant answers but unfortunately they have not mentioned any of these technical model so this is just a quick tip for you all every time when you see that computer screen when you read that question try to see what are the models i'm going to put it up here and talk about it and also you have this uh, the the change management model freeze and freeze all that kind of a thing there can be many models the value chain value analysis functional analysis many of those things you can use it and please start using those things in your in your answers i'm going to look at some mocks today then the business skills now remember you are not a, a kind of an academic you are not a, a person who is answering a paper exam paper whatever you are going to suggest must it must have what we call business sense right maybe the company is going through some kind of a liquidity difficulty and there may be certain suggestions coming from your board of directors or from your colleagues saying um, for example mohammed why don't we go for a uh, short overdraft temporary overdraft yeah that's a good idea yeah but that is costly some person may suggest why don't we go for factoring of our receivables we can collect some money by factoring our receivables yes it's a good idea but it is going to cost us factory fees a third person may come out with idea and say you know we have already given that we are given that 60 days credit for the customers to pay why don't we ask the customers to pay quickly in advance now that may look a very good sound solution because you are collecting money um, quickly and you don't need to pay any interest on overdraft any factor in phase so financially that's a sound sound proposal but business wise it's not a good proposal why imagine i'm the customer mohammed is the finance manager i have been given 60 days credit and now mohammed comes and says hey kuma can you pay me you know in 5 days time what will i think of a and company finance manager or the finance director right you know they are not planned they are in some financial crisis and they are coming and asking me money now that is not a good business proposal so just because the financiers say something we should not go by that kind of a thing we must be looking all the time for much much more solid 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 proposals that is what we should be looking something which has a commercial sense now for example your managing director might come and tell you Uh, you know the workers are going to go on strike and uh, i'm thinking you know better ignore them now that may not be very sound right because uh, you know if you try to ignore them they might go on strike and it can create lot of lot of unwanted problems it may be better for you to listen to them particularly in this case of aen you might find lot of problems from this environmentalist and the protester now you suggesting to ignore that is not a very good business proposal every time we must listen to these people but we must be very strong enough to counter attack any of those things whatever they are saying 
truthfully with full of integrity as sima students sima members we cannot ever ever be untruthful we can never be professionally incompetent in whatever we say that kind of a thing so that's what we call the business skills so whenever you draft a reply you must be looking for those things leadership you are advising the very top people at the board level and probably looking at your suggestion they might go ahead because you know mohammed told it is good or you know one of other one of your, your, your people says it's good and therefore they will think of it so they might say wasim is saying it's good let's go with it but therefore you have a bigger responsibility you must always make very strong recommendation so even though if sometimes examiner or the or your managing director is not asking a recommendation whenever he asking your views you must finally give a recommendation this are the top sima model long time back always a recommendation justification and certain action plan now that's a good style for you to do your answer i have seen you know people who have followed some of these good tactics we are saying this with lot of experience those people have successfully completed this exam with little stress little a kind of a, a tension for them remember take this as not as an exam take this as a day to day office matter and be relaxed in that exam atmosphere uh, try to you know allow the common sense to flow more into your head rather than trying to you know get blocked up looking at that computer screen oh my god i don't know this is much more easier than your objective test question paper i will tell you because you don't have too much of calculations to do and but hardly any calculations to do it's just simply using your office knowledge using your common sense and coming out with what we call a solution that is fit for the moment <coughs> most of these solutions we are looking is for some crisis or a some opportunity that has come today or maybe last week but that's not the end of it we must look at the long term maybe that we are having a problem with our employees we can settle the problem by giving them a, you know whatever the incentive or what or health or health and safety measures but that's not the end we must look at from a long term point of view how to prevent it happening next time right so what are their problems can we appoint a committee to go into that one maybe the customer is complaining the quality of the goods are not good can we think of a quality circle so this is what the leadership is all about finally we come to the people skills now remember we sima people are good communicators so at least we ought to be good communicators we need to communicate our uh, views very well to the other people when i write something to my managing director or ceo and says he should not be running about all over saying that here yeah, this kumar has written something i can't understand it can you explain it now that is a bad communication on part of kumar people skills means we must do it in the simplest way most approachable way now you and i know when we read a book or a mail for that matter simply right if the mail is you know very excited and presented in such a way we will read it from top to the end but if the mail is uh, you know very passive and boring starting point we will not even read it we will uh, just leave it thinking we will read it uh, tomorrow and tomorrow will never come your report or your paper whatever that is given to your boss should be so excited that you know you must uh, visually uh, picture him standing and write, reading this report he will get up from the chair the moment he opens his email or the report whatever he has got from you 
and you will he will read it that way that is what we call people skill so you must uh, you must get this habit of getting into the emotion you know you are working in this company anything good happening in this company your ceo or fiona or some person comes and says hey um, vikas that you know we have got a new proposal oh that is going to make you happy hmm? you may yeah because you are a senior person you must be very happy that the company is getting something like that and that must be expressed in that paper <coughs> you can say i'm so happy that the company has got a project like this on the other side you know some press report has come about the company you know destroying the company you must show that emotion saying oh my god i'm very shocked how these people wrote a thing like that about us about our company now that is what we call people skill now if you see the answers of the sima uh, answers they may not give all that kind of a thing but don't get carried away with that answers because uh, the answers itself says these are only a kind of uh, they are not to be considered exhaustive the other appropriate relevant responses would receive credit so you can get lot of good points from the answers but surely that answer is not a very very comprehensive answer by answering like that you are not going to get through this exam so make it excited remember the four skills and try to work through the four skills all the time right so this has a few things which i want to uh, share it with you all and you remember this paper has three sections most of the time it is 60 minutes 60 minutes 60 minutes but it can be sometimes 60 75 45 45 whatever it is it's a 3 hour paper 180 but uh, we will not see the second section till we complete the first section so in the first section for example if it is 60 minutes even if you do it in 50 minutes the 10 minute saving you can't carry forward for the second section so don't try to save time on the first section thinking you can add that time for the second no you can't you must do the maximum in the first section because the first section ends up and no time can be carried forward to the next section also if you you know if you run short of time unfortunately you are run short of time so i always advise if it is a 60 minutes first section take 15 yeah vikas yes you can you can tell me yeah you can unmute your mic and speak to me yeah in fact uh, are you breaking up kumar in between i i tend to lose you i don't know whether everybody else is having same problem or it's just my internet connection what about the others what about the others are they do they do you all have problems with the connections can you hear me very well uh yes we can hear you okay yeah we can just try but sometimes i know when i try to write on the board it may break up right anyway just see if you are having some disturbances just let me know uh, because i am on a very super internet connection but most of the time what happens is when i write try to write on the board it get disturbed so that is why sometimes when i'm writing on the board i don't speak okay right so yeah coming back uh, what i was trying to tell you all was you know <coughs> uh look at that uh, the the 60 minutes and try to take about 25% of the time 15 minutes to read the question now you must understand this if your boss sends you an email you are not going to reply immediately right you will read it understand what this boss is asking you will take little time to plan your answer and then only you will start answering the question so similarly what i want is take about 15 minutes think to yourself what is she asking what should i do and then only start answering and 
keep about five minutes for a final review because you know when you if you do an email if you do a report you are not going to just do till the last minute and send it you want to see whether the spelling is all right whether the presentation is all right whether you have covered everything and for that purpose keep five minutes so 15 plus 5 20 minutes gone so you have 40 minutes left over that 40 minutes i must see what are the things he, she's asking? So if she's asking five things for the, for, from me, I must take eight minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes. Don't overwrite. Most of the time the examiner says, lot of students are overwriting and they don't cover every area. Remember when your boss asks five things, you must reply to all the five things. Just reply in three things and telling her that, you know, I did not have time. That's not very good. So you must manage your time because this paper, we have seen it to be a very time stress paper. So remember a few of those things whenever you are at that exam center. Then coming back to this, our AEN case. I want to, I'm sure that you all have studied this case very well now, but still, Still another 28 days, 30 days is there. I want you all to do more reading on this case. Few things, I do it, in, a, in fact, I do it every day, to tell you very frankly. I read this case every day, taking 15 minutes of my time to go through this one. And that's how I have been able to uh, put up some mocks for you all. In your Dropbox, there are five mocks already. And if you do those five marks, I can guarantee you that you will be somewhere there. I'm going to do some of the marks with you all. But uh, what I want is to remember this company very well. Remember, this company was founded somewhere in 2000. So it's about 16 year old company. And also, it was founded by four people. You know, they are not family members. They were working in some place and uh, three of them probably in one uh, university, and then a lawyer joining them, the four people, and you can see all four of them are not real business sense people. They are academics and a lawyer, right? So they are not those Bill Gates type of entrepreneurs. So maybe at a later time, you might want to think whether you want to bring a new CEO who can, you know, give a better strategic direction for these companies. Something which I want you all to think about it, something probable question that can come up, because remember Luke took over as the CEO just a couple of years back, and uh, Luke was also academic, but they don't have a chairman in this company. So remember your corporate governance, but again, remember this is not a UK company. This is a, com country, a company in a country called Breesland, so there may be certain uh, certain uh, uh, differences, but surely the UK corporate governance is a model which we can always use. Even though it may not be directly applicable to Breesland, we can say in a model such as UK corporate governance, and you can go on. But remember, right at the moment, this is not a listed company. Now, I want you all to note down there are three types of companies we can have it. I hope some of you all are taking some notes because this can be very useful. There are three types of companies we will have it in anywhere in any part of the world. One is what we call public listed companies. Finally, in UK, if it is a public listed company, they will have the name behind the name PLC. Most of the other countries are the same, but Breesland, we are not very sure. But for almost we are sure with the pre scene that is given, this is not a public listed company. Why do I say so? Because they don't have a share price. They don't have any uh, non-executive directors. So very unlikely to be a public listed company. 
Then there are two other forms of company. It can be a public unlisted company. Public unlisted company. The other one is what we call private company. So what is the difference between a public unlisted company? The first company I said was public listed. I'm almost sure so far it is not a public listed company because there is no share price details given. And in fact, if you really look at the past six precincts we were given, last year it was Dream Park, Rio, Look, all that, if you really look at Sleek, uh, I think this is the only company they are given uh, uh, unlisted company, unlisted company. But being unlisted company, I'm still not sure whether it is a public unlisted company or a private company. What's the difference? I want you all to understand the difference. In a public unlisted company, shares can be transferred from one person to the other person, you know, if I'm holding shares in AEN, if it's a public unlisted company, I can transfer my shares. If Vikas is interested in buying my shares, we agree at a price and I can transfer without getting any approval from anywhere. But if it is a private company, I can't transfer shares like that. I must get the approval of the board of directors if I want to give, transfer my shares to Wasi. In both these cases, we have a problem. There is no share price. Here, always there is a market price. So in this case, I can sense, I will always think in one of the variants, there will be share valuations coming up. So look at your F3, look at your share valuation models and be ready to answer a question in that area, right? So. We are still not sure whether it's a private company or a public unlisted company. Initially, I'm 100% sure it was a private company. Why? Because only four shareholders and they were holding the 25%, the 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. So surely it would have been a private company. No um, shares would have been given to the public. But later on, you can see as you go on reading the uh, pre scene, you will see this company now has issued shares, but we are still not sure to whom they have issued shares, whether they have issued shares to the public or whether they have issued shares within themselves, maybe to the family members, maybe to the uh, employees, and still it can be a private company. So that is a very, very important thing what we need to know, because depending on whether it's a public company or a private company, when it comes for a share transfer, you might have few problems, right? So that's something which we want to pick it up from this paper. You remember this company is a, a consultancy firm. They are not the generators of power. They are not manufacturing anything. They simply do consultancy. So in a consultancy company, you will not have too much of property, plant and equipment. It is the intellectual knowledge. It is the the knowledge of the people behind the scene that is going to add value to the company. So intangible asset valuation can be something that can come up. I want you all to think about some of these things in your, you know, study times and to build up on some of these issues. And also, this is the largest consultancy company in Breezeland, right? All these are picked it up from the pre-scene. Uh, so it's the largest consultancy company in Priestland. So that means it's a company and, you know, so far, no other person has come closer to them and they are a, a fairly a predominant consultancy company. And in fact, the pre-scene says they have a hello effect. Hello effect means, you know, they have been called. They have been mostly called by the people uh, they don't, do, they don't need to do too much of marketing because they have been called because they have been the largest consultants. So they have a big reputation behind them. 
So that's another thing which I want you to pick it up. But having said that one, industry is very, very competitive. There may be a lot of other people who are coming up because the, it's not an area where will, there will be a lot of threats of barriers. So if you look at the Porter's uh, Five Forces, this is an industry where, you know, three or four people, professionals can get together and uh, start up a company like that, right? And uh, you can see they are doing a lot of work with the university on research. 2014, they spent something like $1 million, uh, and in even 2014, uh, 2015, so far they have spent something like $600,000. So they are doing a lot of research work. I want you all to pick up a few things on this. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether already you have got that thing. Look at this company. Look at this PC. They have given, the, the, what is the company's name? Alternative Energy Network, AEN. But you can see their main market is wind power. In fact, if you go down, you will see all projects right at the moment, what they have done consultancy is in wind power. Now you can see the examiner is giving you lot of other alternative energy sources. So remember in what I have seen in the my past experience in the pre scene unlike in your OT question paper, whatever the information that the examiner has given, whatever every single word becomes relevant some way or the other. So here surely he has given you on wind power, it comes Solar, biodigesters, biomass, about two and a half pages or three pages of various energy sources. So surely I can see this company wanting to move into the other areas of alternative energy, right? So ends of matrix of moving into new products existing market, new products into the new market can come up very much because they are very predominant in their wind power. In fact, if you really go down, you will see in their weaknesses, right? they say strong focus on wind power. Now, these are the things which you must cut up your attention because you can see your questions will be built on this area. Strong focus on wind power with little proven competence in other alternative energy. So surely they have a lot of work to do in the other areas. Otherwise, they will, uh, one of these days, they will lose their competitive wage. And if you look at their strategy, they say create shareholder wealth. There are two major strategic objectives to create shareholder wealth. So you and I know through your F3, to create shareholder wealth, we need to go on doing new projects, new projects, new projects, which brings positive in PVs. So you probably will have some questions, some areas to evaluate a new project. You don't need to do any calculations. The calculations will be done, but you may have to interpret uh, in PV calculation and say whether it's a proper evaluation so things like sensitivity analysis, things like discounting rate, things like using the, the beta geared, beta ungeared can be somewhat there. Second objective is to encourage the use of alternatives to fuels. So fuel is something which is depleting and which is not a renewable energy. So almost the entire world is looking for this renewable energy. So they have made they have, they have, they have named some of the things. Wind power is something. Uh, then there is the solar. Then there is this biomass, all sorts of things. So uh, probably they should be developing and encouraging the use of that energy, the alternate energy. So these are their strategies. And this company has something like 90 people or some consultants. 
So they should look after them because your main critical success factor will be your the key consultant. Because you are doing consultancy for your clients and most of the time the clients will build up a, a kind of a one-to-one -one relationship with the um, with the, the the consultant and you must be able to retain attract and motivate those people one good thing they are working with the universities so they have a very good rapport with the universities so the modern day recruitment mostly come from the universities and they must be in a cutting edge to get some people much more than their competitors because they are working with closely with the university few things that i came across in this uh, uh, case study so these are few things that uh, which is you know which was hit in my head all the time but uh, i'm still reading this uh, pre scene and every time i read i get something new and as i go along i will share more and more of those things with you all and what i would like you all also keep reading keep sharing and uh, that's the way to go forward look at every little word see what is the relevance of that word so now you can see this company has grown up it has grown up very steadily and if you really look at their income levels they have got 116 million profit this year after tax last year it was 97 revenue was about 10 percent a kind of a growth not so bad for a consultancy firm to maintain that kind of thing you probably want to look at some of the ratios it's all right you can see the finance charges they have a, a one flat loan which they are not repaid anything during the years 2015 was also same amount 2016 also same amount and they are paying the same finance charges looks like a very long term loan uh, but what i want you to note down when you look at the statement of changes in equity you can see they have paid a very substantial dividend percentage this year 116.3 103.6 they have paid as a dividend almost a 90 percent dividend now one thing you must realize is in this private company, it's a family-owned company or friends-owned company, dividend policy is not very consistent. In a public company, the dividend policy is somewhat consistent because the shareholders should be able to anticipate the dividend and plan for their whatever they want to do it. But in a private company, that is not the case. The four directors, still they hold significant holding they can decide, you know, Luke might say, hey, this year I want to, you know, um, do something and because of that, let's make a big dividend. Next year, they might say, we don't need so much of money. Let's keep the money invested inside the company. So you can see uh, we don't have any details about the history of the dividend, neither about the dividend policy. So we have to be very, very careful when you are commenting. Don't try to comment on things what we don't know remember you are working in the company so if you have some information it's all right but if you don't have any information don't try to speculate don't try to assume presume and put up that's not something what the examiner would like you to do it because you are a responsible person you are not going to go by hearsay you are not going to give some information that you assume and presume you will give based on the facts that you have already placed in your hands. Something which I want to look at. I want to look at this company's balance sheet. I want you to remember, we are the financial statements as at 31st March 2016, and we will be coming to the exam in August 2016. So five months later, from the financial statement. So some things which are there in this balance sheet may have got disappeared, may have got changed during the five months. So you have to be carefully looking for the next five months. If there's any information, we must look for that information also. If you look at here, we can see 
property plant and equipment they have 84.7 million that may be their build because you have to remember this company they started in a particular city in Greenland still they are there now that is told by the examiner I know for one reason where there will be one variant where they will talk about the geographical diversification it can be inside the Greenland it can be outside the Greenland because surely I think it's time 15 years in one place not good enough they may want to move into the other areas other geographical location and you can see software uh, software is one of the key components in this alternative energy business you must have always updated software to do research and also to do the work so 18.9 million is your 2016 balance sheet figure Trade reservers 30.5 million, not so much compared to their revenue. The revenue is about 281, so maybe about 45 days credit they must be giving to their customers. That should be all right because some of the projects may be ongoing projects. Don't have any inventories. That's all right because being a consultancy company you are not going to have too much of inventory the, the the most likely they will have some stationery they will have written off to the pnl then you have a bank balance of 4.2 million last year they had 3.7 and we have a bank balance of 4.2 million now i want your minds to go back to your f1 time f3 f2 f1 Right. Now this is the time for you to open, unmute your mics and give me some answers. Why should we, a company, keep any money in the bank account? Yeah. Uh, hi, oh, good so morning to Jeffrey here. The, yeah. uh, the, the first one is that we, we need to cover monthly expenses, day-to-day -day expenses. So okay. Uh, in, in other words, what we call working capital requirements. Okay, good. Anything else? Anything? Any other ideas that I'll have? Why we have money? Why? Because the money itself is a useless thing to have it in a business. Property plant and equipment will allow you to generate revenue. Software will allow you to generate revenue. Trade receivables is in a way not worthwhile but if you don't give credit you may not be able to do business and therefore it's all right inventory also um, not a very worthwhile asset to invest so much of money but in a in a business where you need inventory without inventory you can't do it you may be stuck out but bank you have money as someone said it is right it is for working capital but i want you all to use a better terminology acquisition Acquisition, yes, in a way, but you don't keep money just in the bank unless you unless there's some acquisition coming tomorrow day after. I want you to I, I know y'all you all know the answer, but I want to refresh your memory. There are trade uh, payables as well. Yes, they don't pay so much. Yeah. I'll tell you why we need money in a business. I'm going to tell you one name and I'm sure some of y'all will refresh your memory. One reason why we need to have money is what we call transactions motive. Anyone now who can remember this one? You would have learned it in your earlier studies. Transactions motive. To do transactions, we need money, isn't it? We need to pay the salary. We need to pay our electricity bill. We need to pay our water bill. We need to pay our travel in claims. You can't show our buildings and everything to our employees and say, look, here we have buildings. You better work. No, we need money to pay. And that is what we call transactions motive. Now, can you think of the second one? Hmm? Not yet coming? Yes. It's precautionary motive. This is in F1. I'm, I'm going back. Precautionary motive. For an emergency, we must have money all the time. I mean, you know, at homes, we keep money. We don't keep everything in the fixed deposits. 
we give money because when a child gets sick, we need money. Similarly, the companies need money for an emergency, right? Suddenly, the the employees will will go on uh, on a on a work work to rule, but you have to pay your electricity, all that, and you need money for so for an emergency. You keep money. Third reason why keep money is speculatory motive. So brush up a little bit of your earlier knowledge also, but don't worry. We uh, we will try to cover up as much as possible this area. So because these are some of the areas which I think there can be questions because one of your directors might come and ask uh, why uh, Sharus we are having so much of money. Why don't we reinvest this money? So you might have to say we need to keep some money for transactions motive, precautionary motive, speculatory motive. This is your technical marks this is your technical mark and then maybe you will decide that you have to keep some money if there's any excess money so how do you know that you will have excess money you have to do what we call a cash forecast after the cash forecast you might find in uh, september you will need money to pay the taxes but today july and august you don't need money you have excess money so you can put this money on some short-term deposits. Excuse me, Kumar? Yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry to, to interrupt. Uh, actually, I, I believe from my perspective, the, this mm -hmm. company is almost insolvent. Com the company, this company? Is, is, is almost insolvent. If you look at the monthly payroll, okay, at the end of July, we'll need to pay something around $4 million for the payroll. Okay, mm -hmm. if you look at the June, the June payroll was a 3.8. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so and if we pad, uh, you know, some uh, additional expenses during the months, and if one of our client is just being late by, let's say, 10 days, then we are we're insolvent, isn't it? Yeah, just see, just see, let's see, let's see how it is, how you came to that conclusion. I'm happy about that. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Where do you find salary is here 1.5? But look at after all that they have earned, right? Now the the April bills because you know you have to assume that the come the, that your clients will pay unless you get a something you know bad client something happening. Your April money will come up in May or June, and like that the cash flows. That is what I said. You must always prepare a cash flow, cash forecast. Cash forecast only will tell whether the company is. I don't see. Uh, a uh, big threat of an uh, insolvency here, Jaufa. You know, recent. But, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, you take the assumption that the clients are going to pay in time and today. Unless you don't, that's all. a going concern concept. That's a going concern concept. Unless there is something very radical, some big customer not going to pay something, you know, you must go on the assumption or the businesses go on the assumption on a going concern. You remember the going concern concept? that the business will continue for the foreseeable future. And if a business is going to continue for the foreseeable future, we should be collecting our money on time. Is it? Agree? I don't see any okay. big, I don't see any I big threat. Mm -hmm. I, I just say, I think that we, we should, uh, considering the volume of cash in the bank account, which is yeah. uh, uh, less than 5% of the uh, of the total asset, mm -hmm. uh, I think we, we should just make sure that the, the, the the collect the receivable collection is uh, yeah is surely the risk is a risk that we need to monitor yeah I think in my view the cash balance is fairly high right in my view the cash because you know they have a they 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 have a uh, they have a trade surplus of thirty point five and last year also they have been having three point seven this year also they have in four point two million so I think uh, you know they are carrying about three million cash in a company like this. With a turnover of uh, turnover of uh, 200 million, 281 million, unless you are thinking of some uh, acquisitions to be done, you might be running with big cash. And you can see even the last next three months, they made a big profit. Assuming the cash is collected, they are made even on on. On the on the profit basis, they have they have 34.6 million profit. So that will also will increase if you really look at it, if if every cash is collected, 
forget about the last month's collection but the the last stream the 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 collections of the the month of march and whatever that was outstanding plus this profit of the last two months the first two months will be still having big cash in the cash balance <coughs> because the profit is going to add up to your cash balance provided you collect your money right so i don't think they have a big problem of a uh, insolvency here unless you know one of their clients decide not to pay something like that but remember they are not depending on one client they are depending on many clients and they do three types of services engineering public relations and legal so they have a fairly a diversified activity they are not dependent on one customer and there can be therefore i don't think they have a very big problem but i want you all to draw i want you to draw your attention to one matter here right now, one thing you would have realized is this company the gearing anyone who had worked out the gearing on this company the uh, the debt to equity the debt of equ to equity is 10 percent yeah yes and you can see the gearing is very low you can work there in two ways debt divided by equity or debt divided by debt plus equity most of the time we work on the debt divided by debt plus equity only the debt what we take is the loans remember not the deferred tax because on the deferred tax you don't pay any interest so the only thing that you take for gearing is the 9.2 divided by debt plus equity. 9.2 plus equity means the whole 86.7. Right. So that will give you about 11%, I think. So generally, a company can go up to about 40%. So they have enough room to raise loans and you know they have enough assets also because they have a, a fair amount of fixed assets property and equipment which they can give it to which they can which they can give it as collateral and raise loans so they have a, a fair amount of room available for expansion in that way and you can see the loan of 9.2 million remains 9.2 million. That means it's not a, uh, it may not be a loan that need to be paid even next year, because if there was a next year component, it would come under current liabilities. So uh, surely they don't have too much of a liquidity problem right at the moment. Uh, they are doing fairly well and they should be able to go on. So that's something. I want you to note this retained earnings later on in a, on another day, I will speak about the retained earnings because the retained earnings of this 46.7 million belongs as at today to the existing shareholders, right? So if you are thinking of going one day public, if you are thinking of inviting new shareholders to this company, this 46.7 million, you have to be mindful that it belongs to the existing shareholders. Now, one of the students suggested, um, if they are going public, what they must do is they must pay this 46.7 as a dividend. Now, fantastic idea because that's the right way to go alone because 46.7 million retained earnings belongs to the present shareholders, the people who are here today, retained earnings as at today, that is 31st March 2016, and therefore it must be paid to those people, right? Because otherwise, tomorrow now new shareholder comes, this retained earnings will belong to him also after that. So he has not contributed towards the retained earnings, but he might get a retained earnings. So how to get away from that problem? So one student suggested paying a big dividend, but we have a problem. What's the problem? Any guesses? You don't have the cash to pay. You don't have cash to pay. Hmm. So that is what I call business sin. If you make a recommendation like that to your board of directors, you look a big fool. They will get up and ask, what are you talking about? Where is the money? Where can we find money to pay, pay a big dividend? We can't go and ask a loan from a bank to pay a dividend. Hmm. What is the alternate that you have? Can you suggest anything that you can do in this scenario? These are possible questions. Hmm. 
what's your alternate you I, can do i would yeah mm-hmm. i i would uh, i would suggest they should go for higher share premium then because you know then the incoming partners or investors mm-hmm. they would pay more for mm-hmm. the same uh, amount of you know uh, yeah, right. portion of that uh, that can be done because considering the retained earnings that i have i will ask for a higher price isn't it yeah right that can be done that's one way that when you are inviting you look at this thing because he is going to share which for he is not entitled to and therefore he must pay a higher premium if he join in the company excellent another way what you can do is you know before you go public before you ask for premiums and all that you can do that one but you can convert all these things into bonus issues capitalize that to free shares bonus shares right maybe one is to one bonus issue kind of a thing and remove the retained earning agree think like that i want you all to think all ways use common sense use out of box you know forget about your textbook studies all that is good but when you are in business world you must be smart enough to think very practical what can be done so some person asks kuma we want to go public you know i don't think we can get a big premium in the market because we are still new company but this money these retained earnings are for us what shall i do the only way that i can think of is to capitalize that issue bonus shares that way you can get out so these are few things which i want you all to note down and uh, you know build up on all these area the, the if i go into the market i just want to get one more thing look at the software in the balance sheet 18.9 Look at your software in the balance sheet. That the written down value, which is eighteen point nine, on thirty first March two thousand sixteen. And now see the next three months. Software amortization is fourteen point nine. So after three months of operation, your software book value will come down to four million. Eighteen point nine, fourteen point nine written off. it will be 4 million so this is good tip for all of you all this company will need to go for a software upgrade very soon so your finance director must be cracking her brain knowing that they have to go for a software upgrade because your software seems to be almost written off and must be outdated so it's time this is why this company has given the three months accounts you can pick up lot of things from the three months account and you can see uh, you have to do this kind of thing right uh, do and you can see if you look at the salaries you can see the engineering um, almost the engineering and public relations go one in one right you can see uh, public relations 1.4 1.4 1.5 engineering you can see in june the salaries have dropped big 3.3 to 1.5 million i want you to pick up on that one right so what does it say must be telling some of our people permanent people have left our company and that can be a little bit of a worrying factor for all of us because if our people start to leave in particularly in the engineering remember engineering was handled by luke earlier but now we are given it to some person and uh, you know big drop from 3.3 to 2.2 to 1.5 within one two months is something that is going to worry all of us and you can see the income also has you know 16.9 to 10.6 but the big drop in the salaries is something which is going to worry us legal you can see it's remain in same public relations it's remain same so these are few things what you can note down from your three months account i can visualize a question in this area engineering some people have left you know this consultancy forms you have to understand very simple very few barry exits very few entry trades you just few people get together form up a company <coughs> and you know you can compete with aen 
Could it be Thank Luke's you. salary itself, which could be expensive? And Luke was uh, Luke was not the chief executive. Luke, Luke was not the director in charge even in 2015. I would have agreed with you if you had, if the trans has taken place in May, May or June, uh, is it? Okay. But he has he he handed over his duty some in 2014. So it can't be Luke's salaries, right? So there's something that is not really doing well somewhere. So, um, you know, uh, we don't know. But my sense says, because these are the questions that we have seen it in the past papers, my sense says, uh, you know, some people have left the company and they have formed up a new company and business is going down and all that. And that can be a bit of a worry. So be remember of that kind of a thing, how to tackle that kind of a situation you want to look at. Travel in and accommodation also, you can see it's coming down. So sometimes we think when the operating expenses, when the expenses come down, it's a good thing. But it may not be so. It may show some dangerous alarm somewhere, particularly when the salaries of our people come down. Operating expenses also going up. Yeah, yeah, Jav, uh, raise the hand. Yeah, why? Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this, All right, I yeah. wanted to... I wanted to come back on the uh, on the software amortization. Mm -hmm. I think, and this is some, uh, something where I really struggle when yeah. I look at the, uh, the the long term fixed assets, you know, from the software and as well the PPE mm -hmm. uh, and as well the level of depreciation. That mm -hmm. something looks odd and wrong, you know. And I I don't see uh, how we can have those magnitude of uh, depreciation for software, you know, depreciating almost in full in three months time, the full uh, the full value of the software. And, and the second point is really uh, in line with what you mentioned before is the, the, the overall value of the PPNE of 90 million mm -hmm. looks really, uh, really huge compared with the, uh, with, the, um, with the business, basically. Huge so, component. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Maybe they are buildings or whatever it may be, right? You can see they are going, they are going not on the revaluation method, because why do I say that? because there are no revaluation reserve. So because of that, surely they must be going with the historical cost. So they would have uh, bought some assets, vehicles, for example, because there are a lot of consultants. They have to give the vehicles for those people, right? So there will be a lot of uh, things like uh, the building may be a big cost. That kind of a thing can justify their property, plant, and equipment. One thing what you would have seen is the property, plant, and equipment is not increasing. So much. 78 to 84, not a big increase because there would have been some depreciation also happening. We don't have any details about the depreciation, but uh, surely, uh, you know, they would have bought some new vehicles because these consultants, you have to provide them with vehicles, etc., computers. So those can be property, plant, and equipment. But uh, you have a point in what you said that software amortization at a rate, big, big thing. Hmm? That also is possible in this industry because sometimes the software may not stay for very long periods. But here we are, here we are, we are saying three months. You know, if you, if you analyze the depreciation, it would be hmm? 60 million a year. Of depreciation so again that's, uh, that's it, it, it may be it yeah because now look at look at the look at the software what they had last year they had 16.2 it has gone up to 18.9 we do not know how much new software came in and how much was written off sometimes in this alternate in this energy sources the 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 the, the, the the amortization can be very, very fast it, because it depends on the model what they are using. Sometimes there may be very specific one, which they take it, the, the software can only have a last life period of six months, three months. Remember, the amortization goes on economic life period of the, the thing. Certain software may not last even for two months, three months. Look at this mobile phone industry. Some of those software don't, they have economic life period of only three months. Same here. Could this is not like. The, could it be that the software value is too high, say mm -hmm. over 100 million, and they're depreciating it in one year? No, 
It can't be because if you see the 16.2 and 18.9, we don't have details to see how much the last year's depreciation was, but we can see it just to get an idea. Right? What we can see is if you look at this year, for example, we can see the software is going at about 5 million every month. Right? 5 million every month. So that means there's a continuous replacement of uh, uh, software coming up. For example, what I see is like this, something like this. Last year when they started, when they started, it would have been 16.2, right? at the, la the beginning of the last year, 2015. Maybe during this year, the, the, say 2014, they would have added up another 60 million worth of software. And software is getting depreciated at around about 5 million a month, something like that. So this now, it is time for them to go for a new software very soon. Because this yeah. industry is the software is not the software is a major cost here. You can see software is a major cost here. Uh, yeah, sorry, Kuma, I have one one point here actually. Okay. Uh, if in such industries where soft, software is so fast actually uh, mm -hmm. changing, uh, in that scenarios usually people do not capitalize, capitalize. or amortize than software. Yeah, they right. do not capitalize. Yeah, because right. it's a monthly basis, it should be taken as operating expenses. As an operating scenario. expenses, you are right. That's correct. Right? So there may be a little bit of a accounting treatment which may we need to correct it also. You are right. Because most of the time, if it, because normally property plant and equipment is capitalized if it has a life period more than one year. If it is less than one year, you can charge it to the PNL straight away. Yeah. So there can be, even that can be a question on this paper about the accounting treatment for the software. Remember with IA 16 talks about the, the things and that must generally have an economic life period more than one year. If it is less than that, it must be written off to the PNL of that particular year. So looking at these figures, what I see is sometimes you don't need to capitalize it. It's part of your operating expenses. Agree? You can see different, different perceptions coming up looking at all these financial figures. That's what I want you all to look at these things in a in a, in, in very deeper way. You might find few things and you know, even this can be a question. Software being amortized at a five million a month, you know, um, should it be capitalized or should it be charged to the revenue expenses straight away? Right. So, yeah, now I think I have basically done a little bit of work with you all. I just want to touch on my first mark, which is the first section. I'm sure you all would have, uh, all of you all had it in the drop box. If you don't have it, you can always sit on the drop box. If you all need any one wants a soft copy, just send me an email. I'm putting my email here. Gmail.com. So anytime you can even even if you answer, I encourage you all to answer these uh, 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 questions, uh, not only mentally answering, writing the answer on the computer screen. So yesterday I saw a student uh, from another country, uh, you know, he had brilliant answers, but his computer speed was so slow, he could not do even one third of what he wanted to write. It. So good to speed typing, because you have to remember you are not going to do it on a laptop. You are going to do on a traditional keyboard. So just start practicing those kind of thing. And because, uh, you know, you must do this in 60 minutes time. So start writing the answers. That way you will develop that mentality to be fit for the paper. Otherwise, you have all the things in your brain. You have never started writing answer. And suddenly when you go there, you will you know, you know, your mind goes all over. 
so i encourage all of you all to start writing answers and uh, and uh, if you can send me your answers in a word document i will correct it will give my feedback and will come back to you all all the time so my email is there or you can send it to anjus whatever it doesn't matter we will correct it for you i will correct all the marks that i put i put a five marks for you all um, so there are five marks right at the moment in your drop box start reading start answering that's the way to go forward so i want to get this first mark that i put for you today so it's a 60 minutes so remember uh, even when you are now doing the marks don't look at the section 2 till you complete the section 1 because in the exam you will you will never see the section 2 till you complete the section 1 and also generally we have seen uh, normally the section 1 section 2 and section 3 are related in something arising from the section 1 the section 2 issue so really you will see a totally unrelated thing coming up it can happen but what i'm trying to tell you is if you answer particular way of a section 1 if you are taken a particular view in section 1 now don't think this as an exam and go and change the section 2 totally radically different way that's not good right because you have to remember you are practical it's a case study you are working in this company say for example if you are recommend a acquisition here in the section 1 section 2 something you see and then you go and say you know don't go with this thing and something you are contradicting yourself you know somewhere and that is crazy so remember again this is not an exam this is your working place so everything what you do should be very consistent today you tell something to your finance director tomorrow go and don't go and change it unless there's some very very compelling reasons for you to change it something has some certain happened and that's the only reason we will change it otherwise never never contradict what is in section 1 when you write section 2 because i've seen lot of students doing this mistake and the examiner is complaining all the time students think it's an exam their first question answered it's a second question no it's connected to the first one almost all the time right so we're going to look at a mock so here you are receiving an email from fiona so you know who is fiona fiona is your finance director administratively you are reporting to her but you are basically working for the entire board so luke will ask questions joshua will ask isabella will ask all the people will ask questions from you so they can, they can come to you there is nothing unethical you be directly answering to them so here from mcdonald to senior manager so remember in your answers never write your name use your designation as senior manager all the time remember this is a uk paper so it's always right to you know not like in our cultures you don't need to say dear sir dear madam all that you can say hi fiona hi john hi look that's perfectly all right hmm. you have to remember the culture of the the countries now in our countries we say dear sir all that that's not relevant here you just say hi that's good okay so this is from fiona the to the senior manager that is you and it's all about subject about a new biomass proposal So Luke, Luke is your CEO, has received a proposal from BioM concerning a proposal to develop a biomass power station in a state-owned land in Breesland, closer to main forestry of Breesland. As you know, for past two years, we have been keenly involved in projects that use other alternative energy sources, and biomass is one of those. So remember, I told you, we are basically in windmill. wind wind power generation but for last two years we have been working very hard so here looks like our opportunity we have got it biomass is essentially wood and other organic waste that can be burned in a suitable incinerator resulting heat makes steam which drives the electricity generate so this is basically the organic waste that is coming from the the wood that can be converted into electricity generator which is a a kind of a alternative energy and it's also a renewable energy because you can keep on 
reforesting, you can keep on growing trees and you can use it. Biomass is a renewable energy that is often created in the forest industry. Burning the biomass causes carbon dioxide emissions. So that can be a bit of a cause, bit of an issue that right? the carbon dioxide emissions people don't like it. But arguably, it's a byproduct of the forest industry. And any event, it would decompose over time if it are not incinerated to generate electricity. So if the protesters come and say you are uh, imitating carbon dioxide, you have to say whatever it is, it will, de when it decomposes, the carbon dioxide will come. It can be argued that this process is less harmful to the environment than, say, burning fuel. So there are certain plus points. Lucas asked me to put together some thoughts. So who is telling? Your finance director is telling. CEO is asked to put some thoughts about the merits of this proposal and whether this would be a strategic fit to us. So now I want you all to take your that white paper or the white board that is given in the exam because I want to know what are my tasks. What is he asking? So the first thing what he's asking is whether this will be a strategic fit for us. So I want to know, because otherwise I will, I will miss these things. Unlike in our normal exam, where the examiner will say prepare something, you know, do something, recommend something. Here you don't see that kind of a thing. You have to read the thing and understand what is being asked from you. So whether this would be a strategy. So we must reply to that one. The project requires us to proceed on the basis that we would build the power station, sell the resulting electricity to the national generator, which has a number of coal-fired power stations, each of which is nearing the end of a useful life, and the coal has to be shipped in. So we should find it relatively easy to guarantee sales. So you have to remember here something. We are essentially a consulting company. We are never generated power to sell power. We advise the other people to generate power, that kind of a thing. But here, the national generator, the biomass, the government is offering you to come and join a project with them where you are going to generate power and you are going to sell power to the national generator. So it's something new for you something which you have never done because you are essentially consultancy company. So whether it's going to be a strategic fit, you may want to think about it. Of course, there will be a, a guaranteed market because the, because the, 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 uh, the, the, what they are doing, the coal ships and all that is, is uh, you know, it's coming to the end of its useful life. And uh, so they will surely buy all whatever you produce and there's a guaranteed uh, kind of a market. Power generators indicated it would be possible to negotiate a three-year contract in first instance. So remember, you are going with a government contract to sell power, generate power, sell power to the government national generator. It's a three-year initial contract, and that will be extended by three-year subsequent contract subject to price and performance. Now that's something a little bit worrying. Remember, all this power generation, uh, initially the government will buy your power, but when it comes for the next renewable contract, they will say, hey, there is a lot of power available for us from various other people, and we can't pay the price what we paid for the first time. So your price may come down. You sometimes they might even say they don't need power. Sri Lanka, a lot of companies went and started power generation and a new government came into power and they said, we don't need your power. There's enough power inside the national grid, we don't need. So there's a big political risk in going into this kind of business. Now, these are the models that you will be putting into your head and thinking about it. So we would be responsible for building and operating the power plant. So this is something which we have never done. We have been advising the other people on the building, but here we are going to build a power plant and not this is not our co-area. We are strong in the wind power. 
but here we are going to do something on on uh, some other power right we also have to pay 50 percent of the cost of the power lines for connecting it to the national grid so we have to build it operate it and also we have to connect it to the national grid 50 percent of that cost also we have to be added so there's a huge capital expenditure other 50 percent being funded by the generator national power generator after six years we need to hand over the plant and land to the generator. So this is typical private public partnership, what we call PPP. This is a typical build, operate and transfer, what we call build, operate, transfer, what project, right? And so that's a kind of a project that we are going to embark on. Please stop keeping paper that I can present to the following. So you have to talk about the a brief in paper. It's not an email. It's a, all about a brief in paper. How can we predict the company net assets is likely to increase or decrease if we commit ourselves to this project? So that's one of the things. What will be the response of the shareholders, including non-controlling shareholders? So we have two types of shareholders, the four people, Still, they hold a significant holding that is Lou, uh, Peter, Isabella, and Joshua. They were the founder directors. They are holding a non controlling big control. But there are some other non controlling shareholders. We don't know whom they are. But there was slight indication in the pre scene that there are employee share option schemes. So, probably some of the employees must be holding, some outsiders also may be holding. You should identify the challenges associated with the project, indicate how we might address them. What are the long term risks associated with future revenues? So there is all it's a six year project. First three years, we probably will have some kind of a guarantee. But second three years, we do not know at what price the government will buy, how we might manage this. Right. To open up your mics and put up your views, whatever you think should be the points to be raised. First thing I want to talk about is whether it's a strategic fit. I want you to think like this. Now, strategic fit, what is the model that I will use? So, to discuss the strategic fit, the best model, I have already put that in your drop box, but I think you all know this one. This is the strategic piece. This model what I can use is Johnston schools with intent, the suitability, acceptability, feasibility. Sorry, uh, Kumar. Yeah. Hi, this is Zubair here. Um, the questions before the question uh, that is asked before strategic fit is the merits of the proposal. Uh, does that also need to be answered before we answer the strategic fit, or is it? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. First thing, what they are asking is. Let us ask some thoughts about the merits of this proposal. Exactly, you are right. Merits of this proposal, whether this would be a strategic fit to us. Correct, yes. Good point. Merits of this proposal, right? So, whether this proposal merit any consideration, should we go ahead with it or should we not? Sometimes some of these things, you although it's separate, you can combine it because when you discuss about the strategic fit, it will also talk about the merits of the project. Right? It will discuss about the merits of the project. So that's why I thought we can use the model Suitability, acceptability, feasibility. So, 
if you are going to talk about the merits and the strategic fit you can i think combine it and discuss it so you can say um, you know when you write in we will we will come to the write in part of it in a minute but we can say uh, i have evaluated the strategic fit and merits of this project to the johnston and scores and between 10 suitability acceptability feasibility model and then you must just write just a half a sentence one sentence what is suitability so in that model suitability is all about whether it is in line with your strategy the new proposal whether it is in line with your strategy you will argue it both ways right what is suitable you will put it but not suitable you will put it acceptability is all about the stakeholders their acceptability primarily the shareholders but even the others like the employees like the blenders the acceptability feasibility is our resource availability money technical competencies human resources availability so that's what we call suitability acceptability feasibility now i want to look at both the merits and the strategic fit together using this model now i want you all to think about is it a suitable project be open <coughs> be open don't try to you know don't try to look at from a narrow window look at from different different windows what do you think is it a suitable project or not so i think it's not in line with our um, with our uh, strategy back, back if you go to the uh, to the model you just described you know i think the uh, the suitability is not suitable for us to uh, to change completely from a consulting firm to a uh, a bot uh, epc project construction company yeah yeah in a way you are right because it's because we are a traditionally a consulting company consultancy company for alternative energies and from that angle if you really look at this is not a suitable strategy fit because we are going into power generation which is not a part of a strategic fit but having said that one in a way we can argue it another person can argue it look at our the strategic objectives it is to encourage alternative use of energy and to create shareholder wealth so you can look at from another angle right you are not going to make a recommendation you are only going to put up your views you must uh, whenever we talk about suitability as you rightly said here in a way it's not suitable but uh, from another angle you can say it's suitable because it's an opportunity through the ends of matrix to go into a, a kind of a new market with a new product right to generate power you know we have been consultants for 16 years 15 years but it may be a good thing for us to go into generation of power with our all expertise everything so from that angle you might be able to say you are not going to make a recommendation but you are going to open it out and say from a, from ends of matrix it's a opportunity for you to go for a new product in a new market and that may make it suitable recommendations will come to later also uh, in our weaknesses is that we are not very s strong in other alternative energies yeah right we don't have so that can come up in the feasibility because we don't have any expertise in this area is it because almost all our projects are on the on the other area so as far as suitability is concerned my one way is it's not suitable because we are a consultancy company and therefore this is not in our line of thinking but in another way the our strategic objective says to create shareholder wealth and to encourage alternative users so this is a uh, this can be in line with strategic objective provided the project is positive with pv and also it is because since it is going to be another alternative renewable energy you can think from that angle but having said that one again i may want to say you remember when you are a consultant you want to be fairly open for any energy any source but the moment you start generating power the moment you are into that kind of a thing your 
openness can get closed, you might be focusing more on this area. So that is now, say for example, I'm doing tuition, right? If I'm working for a company like Kaplan, I will be all the time thinking in selling Kaplan products or BPP products or whatever it means. But if I'm an open freelance consultant, I have the freedom to talk about the Kaplan material, BPP material, and I can recommend the best one. But the moment I get linked up in generating power through wind, through, uh, uh, through biomass, to all my clients, I might suggest to sell biomass. So that way also suitability can be questioned in a way. So these are a few things you will write in. Because now you have to remember, you have 60 minutes, 15 minutes or we'll go for the reading, five minutes you will keep it, 20 minutes, the balance 40 minutes, you must see how many tasks are there. Fit and the merit, I can to go together. Then there is about the shareholder wealth creation. Then about the shareholder responses. Then about the challenges. And then about the pricing risk. So there are about five tasks which I want to write in. So what I'll do is I'll keep eight minutes for each task. And I will do that way. Later on, I might find third task. I don't have time to do things to write for eight minutes. In that case, if I save two minutes, I'll come back and write something. Otherwise, I will be writing 20 minutes on one task and minutes be solved the other thing, which is not good. Every area you must try and cover up. Okay, what about the acceptability of the predict? Acceptability we are talking from the stakeholders' point of view, primarily the shareholders. Whether the project is acceptable to them. So how do the project looks acceptable to them? You have to do a NPV calculation, isn't it? Hmm? NPV only will tell whether the project is a positive, if it's a positive NPV project, subject to a good sensitivity analysis because the figures can change. After three years, particularly the revenue figures can come down. So looking at a very strong sensitivity, these are the technical models you will use it. And doing a pos NPV, if the project brings a positive NPV, it will be a good, it, it will be acceptable to the shareholders because the strategy is to create shareholder wealth. It should be all right. What about the employees? Employees. Uh, uh, one point here. Yeah, uh, sure. One question here, Kuma. Yes. Uh, in acceptability uh, does not depend solely on the profitability of the project, but also there is a factor that in just in case they they go for this project, mm -hmm. they have to sacrifice some of their dividends actually, which mm -hmm. currently they are getting high dividends. Mm -hmm. So do you think we should also mention this point there that yeah. it's not a, a, a tunnel view of the project, but they will yeah. have to sacrifice. Yeah. So uh, because they have to retain some money now in the business to pay okay. for these expenses and project yeah. exp uh, costs or okay, capex yeah. and opex yes yeah. so do you do you suggest we should write yeah we not, why also? not that is a very good point that's excellent point because when it comes to the acceptability the dividend they may have to sacrifice next couple of years hmm? because you may have to take a loan you may have to repay the loan and there can be some covenants coming up you can you know you can think many things that's a fantastic thing what you thought just now you can Right? That also will be a part of acceptability when the positive NPV is all right. But if you are not going to get dividends, that may not be acceptable to the shareholders, isn't it? Particularly the main four. That's a good point. Yeah. What about the other stakeholders? What do you think about the other stakeholders? Now, I thought they will definitely, it's a capital intensive project. They will need to go for loans. Right? Because the shareholders may not have money. The shareholders are primarily these four people. They may not have money to invest. They may have to go for a loan. So what about the lenders? What do they think? Sometimes it may not be acceptable to them because they might say that you all don't have expertise in this area. This is not your core area. By trying to get into this one, you know, typically in companies, when you try to do this, this what happens? You, you, you really lose your focus on the core area. And you might drive, get driven into this new project, forgetting all your clients, 
these are you know practical things what you see in the real business world you must apply everything what you see it in business side to a situation like this so the lenders may not it may not be very much acceptable to the new lenders hmm? yeah uh, kumar bas there is a flip view also uh, mm -hmm. this company has very low gearing ratio yeah so they know still they have uh, uh, i mean some margin yeah uh, in terms of loans so that could be a positive uh, for breach uh, for this company actually an sorry i didn't hear that one can you tell me again yeah can you repeat AEN that one again low gearing yeah uh, aen has very low gearing ratio okay. their, their loans are very less yeah yes so maybe the banks will be less reluctant to get, give them some money uh, yes it's capital intensive we do not know how much capital intensive it is uh, perhaps the mix of equity uh, i mean in terms of retention of dividend and with some uh, long term loans they can do it mm -hmm. and yes there is an argument that they do not have experience of these things but they can acquire some team maybe uh, the team will not be that much that big uh, mm -hmm. but the banks will be comfortable because the company's existing debt equity ratio is is very positive yeah so, so can we write this also yes similar yes. things yes you must you must write all those things whatever that is coming into your head right you must put it up because the banks may banks may look at from a tote because the, generally when i mean you go to a bank to for a loan for a particular project they will ask what is your project right so they will then you have to explain the project and whatever and they will ask what is your experience in this project right you are for consultancy i suppose they will give any amount of money for this company but this is a new project where are your experts right so you might have to say that we are going to recruit some people and all that you know you have to put it in paper and all that kind of a thing gear it low gearing is a big advantage and of course they have high property value which they can keep it as security and raise money but they might have problems in trying to get through the whole thing yeah okay so that's uh, that's something about, the, about anything in the acceptability in the other areas what about our own employees what do you think yeah wasim any about about the employees uh, i think uh, uh, to be honest employee key employees should be happy about that because mm -hmm. you know company is going to diversify and there will be our company mm -hmm. is very thin actually in terms of organization structure mm -hmm. so maybe there will be opportunities for uh, new positions in new management excellent i think that's a good that's a fantastic excellent that this is what i want you all to think it's excellent idea the senior employee will be happy because they might get new training and it's a opportunity for them to groom up is it because the company is very thin right so this is a way for they to for them to go forward super yeah so like that Uh, you have to think. What about the one of the biggest people? I don't think you all ever touched that one. The environmentalist. You can see in this pre scene, lot of problems from the environmentalist. From their point of view, what about the acceptability? Right. What will they one, say? Of course, yeah. They, some of them they will say there is a carbon dioxide emissions. Mm. Mm. uh so there could be some protests mm -hmm. other protests who are arguing based on factors of for example bird killing mm. or you know uh, ugliness of these wind turbines they would be happy so there is yeah. a mix of actually both types yeah right yeah because the people who are going because, but remember you are not going to stop your wind wind power you will be doing that one but the people who will be unhappy will be this forest protecting this you know those people will be very unhappy about it is it mm -hmm. because even though we are going to reforest and all that people will think in the short term it is going to uh, take their things out and that can create lot of problems so this is what we will do it and we will not come to any conclusion we will keep it up at that point now the next one
They ask us about the net assets are going to increase or decrease. So net assets will increase or decrease in a private company will depend because in a public company, of course, the share price will indicate straight away. Looking at the free market hypothesis, right? The things like uh, weak market, strong market, semi-strong market will give it. But uh, a, a company like this, we will get to know this one uh, to only by doing a proper NPV calculation and finding out whether the project is going to create a positive NPV. That will only tell whether the assets are going to increase.